Welcome to DAB Service and Legislative Seminar. As in years past, we typically had a panel um, where the legislative staff, Joy Eli, my counterpart, joined us. This year we're going to do a little bit different. We're going to take the first half and then Joy and her guests will come up and uh, finish out the seminar for us. So I'm Jim Marzak, DAB's National Service Director. I'm pleased to have two senior leaders from the Department of Veterans Affairs here with us today to talk about VA benefits, claims, and appeals. Uh, I want to welcome the Honorable Jaime Arizaga Soto, Chairman of the Board of Veterans Appeals, and the Honorable Josh Jacobs, VA's Undersecretary for Benefits. Thank you both for joining us today. I know you both have very busy schedules and to fly across the country to be with us today is uh, very important to us, so we're very thankful for your time here on a Saturday. No Thanks for having us. Um, I want to start by asking you both just to share a little bit about why you took on these roles, your background, two very, very important jobs, delivering benefits to veterans. So what led you to work for VA and, and in your current roles? And we'll start with Josh. Great. Well, thanks. Well, thanks for having me and thank you to everyone here for all you do to advocate on behalf of your fellow veterans and family members and survivors. Uh, I did not serve in the military. Uh, I did not come from a family that had a, an extensive history of military service. My grandfather served in World War II. But I had the opportunity uh, immediately after college to go to work in the Senate and work for one of the foremost veteran advocates in the U.S. Senate, Patty Murray, and was exposed to uh, kind of the, the world of veteran advocacy and the impact that uh, our country uh, has both when it lives up to the promise uh, of its obligations and when it fails in doing so. And I now have three kids. Uh, they're about to have birthdays, 10, 12, and 14. And what I've come to realize is that if I want my kids to, to, to grow up in a country that is free, that is prosperous, that we need a, a country that is strong. And the way that we keep a country that's strong is by being able to recruit and retain the kind of the fighting force we need. And one of the central ways we do that is by to take care of the veterans who have come, uh, come from uh, previous generations to make sure that we can continue to recruit the, the next generation's uh, fighting force. And so that's, that's in, in large part why I do what I do. And I've had the opportunity to serve at VA three times on three separate occasions. I've worked in the, in the Congress and uh, for the past 15 plus years, I've had the honor of being able to fight for veterans, and uh, I look forward to being able to do that for as long as I'm privileged to do so. Well, thank you again. I, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last few years, and, and uh, you've always been a fierce advocate alongside us to make it right for veterans and their families, so we thank you for your service. Thank you. Chairman? Well, in my case, I'm the, the son of a, an elementary school teacher down in Puerto Rico. My mom and my dad did serve uh, in, in the Korean War, as, as well as my uncle. And then when I went to uh, college in D.C., I did ROTC. So I've been, a, I've been a citizen soldier my whole life. I still serve uh, as an Army JAG in the National Guard. And, and uh, I went to law school, and I practiced law and, I guess, the vocation for service that I inherited from my parents uh, led me. Uh, I was a White House fellow at Treasury, and then I've, uh, I've looked for opportunities to serve. And for the last two governors in Virginia, I serve in their cabinet uh, as Deputy Secretary for Veterans and Defense. Uh, so most of my emphasis has been in the law and uh, national security. But then in that role in Virginia, Virginia has 725,000 veterans. And, and we like to say that we're the most veteran-friendly state in the union. So through that work, then, uh, I was mobilized from 2018 to 2021 uh, with the Army, and, and at that point, I, I was uh, offered the opportunity to join the team and serve, and you know, uh, as you heard the Undersecretary, uh, if you have the opportunity to serve others, uh, you, you, gotta, you gotta grab it. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an expert in veterans law. Uh, I did serve as Chief of Trial Defense Services for the Army Guard having jacks across the 54 National Guards. So I think that experience of managing uh, lawyers, which is somewhat hard, no, it's like herding cats. So, uh, uh, but managing, managing lawyers in the Army, I think it's what probably uh, led to the opportunity to serve. And, uh, and, and I'm uh, uh, very honored uh, to come in and make sure that 
my fellow uh, veterans uh, are given what they deserve from my dad who did economic development and was a public servant his whole life after military service. Uh, I've always been of the view that government can work if you do uh, put in the right uh, people and systems to make it work. So I, I, do come, I do come to this position with a lot of optimism that if we, using the Army logo of mission first, people always, if I can take care of my team at the board uh, while realizing that the goal is to serve the veterans and if you treat every case like you are, like it's your own case, how would you like your sibling, your dependent, your loved one or yourself to be treated that if we do that, uh, then uh, we'll achieve the mission, the mission. And I'm extremely proud to serve with Undersecretary Jacobs, Undersecretary El Nahal, uh, Undersecretary Quinn, who's now back in Montana, a fellow, fellow National Guard flag officer, and, uh, and under the leadership of our secretary and our deputy secretary. I can tell you that this team, we meet every morning at 8.30. Uh, this team is fully committed to putting the veteran at the center of what we do. You heard from the secretary this morning, a great leader. And uh, so we're just, uh, uh, I think the summary is very proud to be in the team. Uh, I humbly believe we've done a heck of a lot. I don't curse as much as uh, other leaders, so I say heck. <laughs> uh, 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 we've done a heck of a lot, uh, but uh, we do recognize that there's still a lot of work to be done. I'm glad to be here, and uh, uh, I'm thankful for the invitation. Well, thank you, Chairman. First, thank you for your military service and your continued service mm -hmm. as a reservist, but also in addition to your role at the board. Uh, we certainly appreciate it, and we certainly appreciate working with you and your team. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about, you know, PACT Act and, and what that impact has been for both of you. Um, there was already a backlog of claims. There was already a large inventory of appeals at the board. And then PACT Act passes. And the, the amount of outreach that VA has done has been tremendous, um, really encouraging people to come in and file for their benefits. Uh, and we've done the very same thing. We're out there telling people, you got to come in, let's file your benefits. So a record number of claims have been filed. And as the secretary mentioned, 75% of those claims, uh, PACT Act related, have been granted. Yep. Uh, well, that's amazing to hear. But what I want to hear from, from you, and we'll start with the undersecretary, is, is what's that impact been like for you? We know there's about a million claims pending right now, mm -hmm. about 250,000 in the backlog. Yep. Um, when are we going to see some progress and what does that how does that impact you and your operations yeah so i will i'll tell you uh, vba uh, has a workforce now of 34,000. approximately half of the workforce a little more than half uh, are veterans many more are family members of veterans or active duty service members everyone's a veterans advocate so the pact act has enabled us to say yes more uh, and it's something that has uh, been uh, a boon to, to the workforce and the morale because we want to get to yes, but we have to do, follow the law in order to do that. And the PACT Act allowed us for the first time to be able to care for millions of additional veterans and survivors. We've already granted more than 1.1 million PACT Act claims since the law was enacted nearly two years ago. That's an incredible yeah. amount of work that would not have been uh, possible without the advocacy of DAV and other veteran advocates. Uh, from a total workload process, though, what it has meant is we have seen a tremendous uh, increase in the total number of claims. Uh, last year, uh, we received 2.4 million claims. That's a 40% increase. Nearly half a million more claims were filed last year than were the previous year. And that's a good thing. And we're actively encouraging veterans and their families to, sur to submit those claims. We're trying to reach them where they live rather than waiting for them to come to us. But what that's meant is that it has increased significantly the amount of work that we have to complete. We have grown our workforce by more than 33%. So when I joined this organization two years ago, we had 25,000 employees. We now have more than 34,000 employees. And thanks to their hard work, we're delivering more benefits to more veterans than at any other time in our history. So I mentioned I have been at VA on three separate occasions. 10 years ago, I was the senior advisor to the secretary for benefits when the claims backlog was at its peak. 
Uh, for anyone who watched The Daily Show, you could see VBA and the claims backlog on a regular basis being lambasted. You could see our regional offices that were basically crumbling under the weight of all the paper claims. There's been a tremendous amount of transformation since that time. We were happy if we could produce four to 5,000 claims a day 10 years ago. Now, thanks to the work of leaders like Rob Reynolds, a, a DAV member who's been helping us continue, who, who had been helping to, to lead the automation, been driving more efficiencies in the system, we're regularly producing 10,000 claim days. So to give you a little comparison, 10 years ago when the backlog was at its peak, 70% of our entire inventory was over 125 days. Today, it's less than 30%. So still more work to be done. We're delivering claims in about 150 days on average. That's longer than 125 days, but we're delivering more benefits to more veterans. And so as we continue to increase the total size of the workforce, as we continue to draw more efficiencies from process improvements, and as we continue to build on the good work that Rob led through the automated uh, decision support effort, we're gonna be able to achieve continued efficiencies moving forward. And we expect the backlog to come back down to about 100,000 by the end of next year. You talk about those efficiencies, it's interesting. You know, when yep. I started 23 years ago, it was 12 to 16 months it took a claim to be decided. Now it's mm -hmm. an average of 150 days. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to let everyone know here, right, that uh, Josh has had his a lot of VA employees here at the convention. They're down on the second floor and in uh, room 213, you can file a claim and examinations can be provided on site. So if you're here at the convention and you need to do that, we're here to help you and take care of that. And we did that with the support of the undersecretary and his team. Um, Chairman, what's, what's, it, what's it done to the inventory at the board? And what are you guys thinking future-wise on how you're gonna bring that inventory down and take care of as many people as you can in an appropriate manner to make sure their claims are decided properly? Good, so I think just like uh, at, at BBA, we've grown and I'm an optimist, so, but I, I don't think I'm being biased when I say they are breaking records every year. We are breaking records every year. I'll tell you the stats now, and so I'll, I'll tell you where we're going, and I think we're on the right track. So when I joined, uh, we had around 1,200 employees. Uh, I want to commend the president, because the president has uh, approved 50 more veteran law judges at the board. So we went from 90 judges to over 130 judges. Uh, when I met and I arrived and I met with the judges, they said, I need more attorneys. Last year, we hired 199 lawyers at the board. This year, we're on track to hiring, by September 30th, 180. So we're, we've grown. With that growth has also come the growth of output. Uh, when I joined, we were doing around 1,900 decisions a week. We're doing 2,300 decisions a week, okay? So that is uh, basically over a 20% increase in two years. Uh, the board had a record number of decisions last year. Two years ago, it was 95,000. Last year, it was 103,000. We're on track to doing more than 111,000 decisions this year by September 30th. So that's the output. At the same time, well, what about the inventory? The inventory, when I came in, it was 209,000. It went up to 216,000. Last Monday, it was 200,200. I am hopeful, and I'll report back on Monday morning to you, Jim, that we will be below 200,000 on Monday. That is critical because that includes both legacy and AMA. I want to publicly commend the DAV for all the work that you've done, your legislative director and others, uh, to get the AMA approved. So the AMA was adopted and we implemented it in February of 2019. But when we started AMA, we still had the whole legacy batch to manage. Legacy, at one point, we had 475,000 legacy cases in the inventory. This week, the legacy inventory at the board, it's 8,000. The leg cool. there you go. Uh, 
and the joint inventory between BBA and us, it's below 40,000. So we have finally put legacy behind us in the last few months. In the meantime, since 2019, for the last five years, AMA has been growing. I am glad to report that over the last two months, the AMA inventory, it's also coming down. So we have 8,000 legacy cases and 192,000 AMA cases, and that number is going down. For the first time in the last couple of months, we started doing more AMA than legacy. Last week, 76% of the 2,300 cases we did last week were AMA. So uh, I would say that uh, fortunately, in spite of the PACT Act, I want to commend once again BBA because the PACT Act has been great for our veterans. It's added work and claims to BBA, but fortunately, between a higher grant rate and I guess the great quality of BBA, they've also focused a lot on quality, we're not seeing an increase of the number of cases that we're getting from BBA as of now. It's been around 70,000 new claims or new appeals that we get from BBA a year. Remember, you get 70,000. If we're doing 111,000, I like that delta. So fortunately, we've been able to uh, improve the inventory, reduce the inventory. The, uh, the AMA cases are being decided almost four years faster than legacy. And remember what I just told you, we had to put AMA on hold because it's still first in, first out, and those legacy cases keep churning. Many of those legacy cases are on their third, fourth, fifth appeal round. Okay, that's why uh, legacy held back AMA. I'm very hopeful that at this point, uh, we will continue to see a reduction in the direct docket of AMA. So to all of you, the message is, the board is focusing on AMA direct. The AMA promise is that AMA direct cases will be decided at the board in an average of 365 days. I am committed to achieving that in this calendar year. So in order to do that, we are focusing our resources on the direct docket. I call it the HOV. That is the fast lane. So to your, to your uh, veterans, you want a fast decision from the board, choose the direct docket. I'll close up with this on this issue. AMA gives choices to veterans. It's the, for me, it's the greatest aspect of AMA. It's allowing the veteran to go back to BBA after a decision before having to come for an appeal. It's called a higher level review. We're seeing that veterans are selecting that option and that many of them are getting a grant under the higher level review, faster and simpler. So uh, the message out there is if you have an option for the higher level review, there's no reason to come to the board. If you need to come to the board, we'll go ahead and take care of you. We're focusing on the direct docket and we expect uh, uh, that docket to be on time soon so that then we can move to the evidence docket, which is a year and a half, and then the hearings one, which would be the last one we will manage uh, to make sure that we meet the AMA uh, uh, commitment of deciding hearing cases in an average of two years. Chairman, I, you know, it's, uh, yeah. That's one of the great benefits of AMA when it passed was more options and, and uh, it didn't stronghold you into one particular process. Uh, one of the concerns that we have and a lot of our membership has is the, the number of hearings and how long it takes to get a hearing at the board. So I wanna get your thoughts on that. We actually let, we have a few national service officers who stayed behind from the convention to conduct those hearings. It's that important to us and our membership and those we, that we represent that, that we're available for those hearings at any point. Uh, so if they get scheduled a hearing, we wanna be there, we wanna be able to represent them. We don't wanna cancel that, postpone it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and I know that's one of the struggles the board has dealt with. 
So I want to hear from you a little bit about the hearings. I mean, it, it, right, there's over 70,000 pending right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems like there's more coming in than are getting completed each year. And so how do we plan to really address that issue? So thank you, thank you for the question. The, the, the fact is that last year for the second straight year, the overall inventory of hearings pending was reduced. But yes, it's from 72,000 to 71,000 and it's now at 70,000. So hey, I understand. Once again, if you keep at that pace, you'll be on time. You, you'll clear it in 70 years. No? So that's not what you want to do. But I, I do want to say we're, under, we're, we're on it. When I came in, as a result of the pandemic, before I came in, there was a focus on hearings. The board did a record 30,000 hearings in FY21. And, and so that's the good news. I did feel that we were sending the wrong message to veterans. When, I give, when you get a hearing and then you don't hear anything about your case for a year. Most reasonable persons and veterans think that if I go to a hearing and I have Judge Jacobs hear my case and see me in the eye and I provide the evidence and I go home, you expect two things. One is, that my case is moving, so I'll get a decision in a reasonable amount of time. And two, that I will get a decision from Judge Jacobs. Well, as a matter of fact, no. Judge Jacobs was doing a report and putting it in a binder because you just stay in the same place in line. And two, three years were going by before you were getting your decision, but you were getting, it, you were getting your decision from another judge, not from Judge Jacobs. So I said, I don't think that's fair to the veterans, so now we have a program by which, in most cases, depending on the time frame and whether the judge is available or not, but in overall, pretty much in every case, the judge that hears the hearing will be the one that does, writes the decision. I think that's progress. Number two, I don't think that raising the expectations of having a hearing early and then having you park for a long time helps the process. So to be sincere, we, I prefer to have more decisions and less hearings than more hearings and less decisions. So uh, I still want that hearings inventory to be reduced. We're doing around 15 to 20,000 decisions a year, last year and this year. So, uh, so the hearings process will continue. But be aware. AMA asks us to focus on the direct docket and the evidence docket. So I also want to make sure that we don't send the wrong message to the veterans, making them think that the hearings docket is faster than the other dockets, okay? I know there's a tradition that you just fill the hearings block when you're gonna do an appeals. No, you have a hearing if you need a hearing. There's no data that shows that you get a higher grant when you have a hearing than when you don't. So we want to be expedient with services and with speed. So the fact is only ask for a hearing if you need it. On the hearing side, it's been reduced. I want to commend DAV for all the work you do on the hearings side. The fact is that we are able to do hearings now fully virtually. The veteran can do it from her house. The VSR can be at their place of work and the judge will be at her or his place of work. So with that content, we should not be having too many suspensions or no-shows. Unfortunately, we continue to have what we would consider a high number of those. And as a result, I want you all to understand when you have a hearing, this is not like traffic court. Traffic court, okay, Joe is not here, so Gene, what traffic light do you run? Tell me your story. No, here, we go to read the file. I have attorneys that get ready for that hearing, judges that get ready for that hearing. When you have a no-show, that's a couple of hours of each person involved that is lost. So just as an appeal to all of you to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we conduct you know, when you schedule a hearing, we do. We have a very active hearings team that is uh, more than glad to work in rescheduling and all that front. But I would say the hearings inventory, it's not growing, 
It's not reducing as fast as we would like, but I believe that the key thing is to reduce the time to get an answer from the board. No decision is being held back because there hasn't been a hearing. Remember, the key now is to make sure I want to be able to come here and say, I don't have a case that's older than five years. I cannot say that. So we're looking at the oldest cases and we're looking at the direct docket and that's why the hearings, it's at this point, not the focus of our work. So when you talked about the virtual hearing process, um, you know, veterans often want to be able to tell their story on why they believe they're entitled to benefits. And you're saying that they're still able to do that in a virtual setting. They don't even have to leave home. They could request that through their representative and request a virtual hearing versus an in-person hearing because the board's only sending judges out to regional offices. How often does that happen? So as a matter of fact, we're, we're almost, almost uh, eliminated okay. uh, the, the in-person, uh, the travel boards. So uh, uh, my team told me they were gonna do the last travel boards in June. They've come back and they've told me they have like 30 or 50 veterans that are still requesting a travel board. That's a choice they have. So we probably will go out, but understand that when I pull a judge out of the line and send her to Jacksonville, that's a couple of days that that judge is going down. Whereas if that judge is in, 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 at, at uh, their place of work, the judge can hear eight cases in a day. So, uh, so that, that, that's, that's where it is. Yes, the, the fully virtual is just like a, a WhatsApp call, a FaceTime, you're on the screen. And, uh, and to that point, I also want to indicate that the, the, the judges at the board uh, with the last group recommended by my predecessor, uh, nominated by Secretary McDonough and approved by President Biden. Uh, that's, uh, that includes not only judges that have work at the board, but judges that are, have either been social security judges, immigration judges, retired senior judge advocates. So the number of judges that are veterans has grown up from 8% to 24%. So to your comment about relating to the story, a judge that understands your experience we now have a much more diverse, uh, and I would say it's not only the most diverse, but it's the highest qualified judge corps. By the way, at one point after World War II, because judges had to be combat, uh, needed to be, uh, they had to have combat experience, we went from a, a, a board that had women to an all-male board. But fortunately, I'm glad to report that today, 57% of the judges are women, the fastest growing veteran population. So uh, uh, to that effect, so that's another great piece of news. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really speaks to the evolution, the efficiencies that are being created, right? It's more efficient for a uh, judge usually had to travel to an office, right? So there was a day of travel and, and then they do, you know, eight hearings a day um, and then they would travel back. So uh, it is more efficient and, and under Secretary Jacobs, we. You were speaking to efficiencies and you mentioned um, automation a little bit ago. Uh, and when I think some of us think of automation, we think of these driverless cars that are out here in yeah. Phoenix that everyone has been seeing. Um, you know, it's artificial intelligence and, and other technologies that are being used in processing claims. And I think a lot of people believe that, well, there's no person touching that case that, you know, there's uh, the computers making the decision. So I wanted you to explain that a little bit about what uh, the automation process really is for VBA right now. Absolutely. Well, before I talk about where we are and where we're going, I just want to reflect a little bit more on where we've come from. Right, Ten years ago, this was an organization that was entirely paper. And uh, I talked to, to Bill Meadows here, who used to rate claims in uh, Winston-Salem. He'd have to come in on the weekends, go and physically look at the, the claims files, and then they have to work to ship them out to other regional offices if they didn't have the capacity to do it there in a timely way. We've been able to um, go from a paper to a paperless process, and now we have a system called the Veterans Benefits Management System. Uh, that enables us to do, do that work much more efficiently, and we have a workload management system that helps distribute the workload across the country. And were it not for that transformation, we would not have survived the COVID pandemic and been able to continue granting 
benefits. Now, having said that, we still have a, a long ways to go and we need to skate to the puck of, of where technology has taken us. Right now, the, the major way that we drive our production is through people and we've grown significantly, but we can't just keep hiring our way out of uh, the workload challenges that we have. And so we have work that was spearheaded, designed and implemented by Rob Reynolds leading the automated decision support where we're figuring out ways to automate the process where we can, you know, our claims processors have to, to look through hundreds if not thousands of pages of documents, whether it's military records or health records. And through the technology that we have been piloting, prototyping and piloting and then deploying nationwide, we're able to aggregate that information in a summary sheet where the claims uh, a processor can go in, figure out what they need by clicking that link, going to the evidence, and being much more efficient in the way that he or she uh, makes a decision. And so we're not talking about taking humans out of the equation. We're talking about figuring out how do we optimize computers so that they do what they do best while ensuring that we can optimize uh, humans and the role of the human in making that final decision. Uh, the, the bottom line for, for me is we are delivering more benefits to more veterans than at any other time in our history, and our workforce has gone above and beyond to deliver that. They have been working mandatory over time for several years to keep up with the, the demand. We've added 9,000 new employees in the last two years. That's net employees. That doesn't count for the attrition, so we've hired even more. But we have to give our employees more tools. We're now looking at things like generative AI. So we have our manual. Uh, we have policy documents that all of our employees have to understand and be able to reference when they're making their decisions, but it changes all the time. So we're looking at finding ways that we can give them more tools uh, to more effectively and accurately be able to go in and figure out where they need to cite a reference to. And we're also looking, uh, leveraging the technology to figure out how we can apply this to help improve quality of our decisions. And so there is a lot of incredible opportunity uh, uh, happening. Uh, we're, we're already demonstrating some significant results and we have a long ways to go. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, right? So they're creating a ton of efficiencies for the employees and, and how they're doing their job. And what we get a lot of questions about from veterans are is, well, how can I find the status of my claim? How can I find the status of my appeal? Can you talk a little bit about the enhancements you've made there and what that looks like for them? Because as you know, everyone today has a cell phone and when they yep. want their information, they want it now. And, and I think there's some great things you have available, but I'm just not sure everyone knows about them that they can go out and find some of this information themselves when they want to know what's going on with their, with their case. Absolutely. Well, I would say if you haven't already downloaded the VA app, I would say go to the, go to the app store and, and download that onto your phone. You can also go online, go into uh, va.gov to check on the status of your claim. One of the things that we've realized is that there's a lot of internal VBA language that makes sense if you're in the organization. But if you're outside the organization or you're not working the VBA claims process full time, you may not understand what it actually means. And a good example of that is claims that are deemed ready for decision. Well, any normal person who's gonna look at the uh, status of their claim and say, oh, it's ready for decision, it should be ready right now, would rightly assume that the decision should be forthcoming. But there are multiple reasons why that may not be the case. So we're changing the way that we describe the status of the claim. And we've gone based on feedback from veterans and from VSOs to make changes on the website where we can go and more accurately and effectively communicate what the status of that claim is. Yeah, that's great. I mean, again, I think it's very beneficial for be able to get online and see what's going on with their case throughout the entire process. The more informative it is, the better. And, and I know we've worked very closely with both of your teams on the language that's mm -hmm. presented to uh, our customers, essentially, yep. the veterans and, and the claimants and the survivors that are, that are filing those claims. Um, another common question we get is about VA examinations, mm -hmm. you know, because Again, I think years ago, a lot of people went to VA, to a VA hospital for an examination. And now you're getting called and uh, right outside, we have three mobile units that are, mm -hmm. that are conducting exams in these mobile units. Can you talk a little bit about how um, 
VBA is really using contractors to yep. complete a lot of those compensation and pension exams and why that's important. Again, another efficiency that I think mm -hmm. is needed in order to really gain control of the inventory, the, the number of claims that are being filed and the number of issues associated with those claims too. Yeah, so today, approximately 90% of all of our exams are done by one of four vendors. The remaining, and three of whom are here on site, and if you need assistance going to, to do an exam, you can do that here while you're in Phoenix. The other 10% of exams are completed by VHA. But as you pointed out, this is not how it has always worked. And so it's, I think, appropriate that we're in Phoenix while we're talking about this, because a major driver for us to change the way that we completed exams was the Phoenix access crisis. So VHA was dealing with uh, a major challenge in getting veterans in to see their clinical provider in a timely way. And we needed to do a better job of being a good partner so that they could see more veterans in, a, uh, in the appropriate amount of time. So we worked with Congress to provide some different authorities. We started piloting uh, the, the use of contract exams. And now we've gotten to the point where 90% are provided uh, by those vendors. The process works um, uh, in a manner where every single exam request first goes to VHA. So if they have the bandwidth to see uh, the veteran for one of these exams, they will go to VHA. If they don't, it goes to one of the vendors. We are very mindful that the exam process is one of the most painful parts of the claims process. Uh, and that's for a variety of reasons. One is the scheduling process can be difficult. Uh, two, a veteran may be required to travel a significant amount uh, of uh, time or distance. Three, they may show up to a location that isn't clearly marked. Four, they may see an examiner and feel that they didn't get enough time with that person. And so there are all of these reasons uh, why it's a, a potentially painful process, not the least of which is this is a forensic examination. It's not like going to your doctor like your general, uh, your, your general practitioner. So we're working to improve the experience. We're working to ensure that they're providing timely quality exams. And we have mechanisms in our contract to both incentivize or financially penalize the contractors if they're not living up to those requirements. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I think that's very important. And again, I like that the fact that we have these folks here on site and we're gonna mm -hmm. make it accessible for them while they're here. Mm -hmm. uh, again, thank you for that support. It's, uh, yep. it's really, really big for us. Um, the next subject I wanna talk about is claim sharks. And, and what is a claim shark? And I, what I want everyone here to know is that, you know, these folks are taking advantage of veterans, survivors, um, where they are unaccredited. So DAV, National Service Officers, are accredited uh, to practice law before the Department of Veterans Affairs to represent you. Uh, a lot, uh, all the other major veteran service organizations have accredited service officers. And now there's these firms and these big advertising, advertisers, if you're on social media, you're seeing them. You need a, if you need help filing a claim, come here. And they're charging, you're getting into a contract um, and legally, they're not even allowed to help somebody. Um, and it's became a really big business, uh, as both of you know. Um, and it's not that they're taking business away from us, uh, right? That, that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that they're charging absorbent fees. They're, they're calculating their fees based upon the benefits they get from VA. Um, and these folks are really trying to lobby Congress to get the laws changed to allow them in the process, even though there's an established process for them today, but it's not lucrative enough for them. They don't believe they can make enough money doing it the way because there are attorneys that charge fees um, that's very structured and VA approves those fees, right? They don't wanna be part of that process. They wanna charge whatever they wanna charge. Uh, and it's very scary. Um, because I think they make some false promises on uh, what they're gonna achieve for you. And if, they, and if you get anything, now they're coming after you and they're, they're getting uh, creditors to come after you if you try not to pay. Uh, and it's very scary for a lot of veterans. So um, I know I've worked with both of your teams on this issue and, and so I wanna hear a little bit about your thoughts on it. If either one of you, yeah. we'll start with the chairman if you want. Well, the, the fact is that in, in our case, it's appeals, not claims. So most of the claim sharks happen at, 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 the, at the initial level. 
in our case, uh, the, the, uh, the cases, you know, uh, uh, for me the core is to have the veteran at the center. And uh, what, what we do see and we've raised a concern uh, is that in many cases, cases are appealed from the board to the court and there is something called EJA fees, equal justice uh, access, well access to justice uh, fees. So when a, when a claim is appealed to the court, uh, that those attorneys do c collect the, by the VA pays fees to those attorneys who are representing veterans at the court. And for me, the key aspect is that in many cases, the veterans benefits do not change. The veteran doesn't get any increased benefit, but the attorney does receive a fee. And I think that's one that we need to be very sensitive about. Uh, the court has decided that when a decision is remanded by the court to the board, that the attorney can collect fees for that. And if your case is remanded, the veteran, it's nowhere, uh, nothing has changed for the veteran. But, uh, so that's, that's one, but it's a different issue. So yeah. on, the, on the claim charts, uh, yeah. it, it's more of a claim side, so I'll turn it over to yeah. the undersecretary. Well, you mentioned that uh, it's illegal to charge veterans to uh, help with an initial claim. And I think it's pretty clear cut. The issue is that uh, there are no longer criminal penalties associated with that. There is a law change uh, that removed those. And, and you mentioned there's ongoing debate about how to reconsider some of the law uh, with respect to these claim sharks. The, my view is that you know if you serve this country, if you put on the uniform and you, uh, you sacrificed uh, to protect my freedom, you shouldn't have to pay anything to access your earned benefits, bottom line. But, well, we know that these claim sharks are making false promises and giving veterans false hope. They're telling them, we can give you a decision faster, we can get you a higher rating. The challenge that we're, we're seeing, and we have limited visibility into this, uh, but what we know from uh, Inspector General reports and from other oversight uh, 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 insights is that there's fraudulent behavior happening. There may, be, there may be the use of doctors that are on the payroll of these claim sharks. There may be um, uh, misstatements on, on the, the paperwork. All of those things could land the veterans who are working with these claim sharks in significant trouble. And the thing that I worry about is it's not gonna be the claim shark that's getting hauled in front of a judge, it's gonna be the veteran. Because they have written these contracts in a way that allows them to escape justice. And so we're working very closely with law enforcement uh, where we identify concerns, we're uh, referring cases to the inspector general, and we're actively working to try to increase awareness so that veterans, their family members, survivors, know about the importance of working with an accredited representative like VSO, like DAV, because we know when we have proof that when veterans work with accredited reps like DAV, they actually have a higher grant rate. Um, and so we're gonna keep doing that. We're gonna keep getting the word out. We're gonna keep working with law enforcement and, uh, and, and uh, working hand in hand to make sure that we do what's best for veterans. And we certainly appreciate the support. I, I, you know, one of the things that frustrate us is that, you know, we have to answer the general counsel ourselves, that we have to share with them our training program, how we're doing our continuing education, and these folks are not held to any of those standards, yep. right? So these are folks that, you know, a lot of them aren't veterans themselves, uh, haven't been through the process, but they're out there like, oh, I think I could help you, and then they're charging these, these crazy fees. Uh, but the no accountability is a big issue. So yeah. we, again, appreciate the support. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about uh, just for a few minutes is decision notification letters. Um, a lot of our veterans getting 16, 20 page letters from VA, from the board, and the board made a change at one, at one point, the, when you got a decision from the Board of Veterans Appeals, the, the decision was all the way at the very end of that packet. Now it's at the front, which uh, I think was a great move. But a lot of the language that you mm -hmm. talked about, uh, Josh, was uh, some of it's unnecessary, but a lot of folks understand, but 
the law requires a lot of that to be in the yep. letter. Um, yep. At one time, the letters were very short, but as new laws are, 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 are passed that impact veterans' benefits, VA has to notify veterans properly, yeah. and a lot of that has to do with that. But we are working on some changes with both of your teams in regards to uh, easing those standards to a degree, just so the letters aren't as confusing to try to make them as clear as possible. Just want to yeah. let each of you talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, first, let me just say thank you uh, for your input and, and the collaboration of DAV to help us uh, make these better. Uh, with no offense to, to my friend, the chairman, these letters were written by and for lawyers. And, and so it's very, very confusing. In many cases, we're doing it because we have to under the law or because of certain court cases. But I think there's a way that we can both fulfill those legal obligations and also write letters in a way where most people can understand them. And so we've got a work group that's comprised of a, a number of organizations. We've identified the top five letters. We're gonna be working on notification letters to make sure that we're simplifying and streamlining those. And then we're going to target the next tier of letters working on both the volume of letters and the subject matter uh, importance. Thank you. Hey, this is a critical area. Uh, you know, as I said, my dad is a 90 year old, turning 91 next month. Korean War veteran, and I go to, it, 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 you know, we, we, it's necessary that when the veteran gets a letter, the, the, they can decipher what the heck the letter is trying to say. Uh, so that's an important issue for us. Uh, and we've made a tiger team together with the, as the secretary said this morning, we're not gonna wait for the veteran to come to us, we gotta get to the veteran. So this is an area where we've worked. We've created a tiger team, it's called the letter review tiger team. I wanna specifically commend a DAV uh, service officer, Matt John, because uh, Matt brought his input and we already at the board have changed the pre-docketing letter based on that input, working as a team. So the pre-docketing letter now, it's much simpler. And now we're working with the hearing scheduling letters uh, also in the Tiger team to simplify that. So uh, uh, even as a lawyer, you want to make sure that the letters can be read by anybody. So kudos to you and, and to that input. So uh, understand that and we're, we're on it. That's the, our office of the um, clerk of the board that's working on, on, on that issue. And if, you know, it's not only an issue, this issue has made it all the way to the hill uh, uh, on importance because I think we all realize that communications is critical. If we're gonna be more efficient, if we're gonna serve more, if we're gonna do it virtually, we're gonna be able to communicate faster and better. I think we're doing it faster, we just need to do it better and we're on it, so thank you. I do want to ask one final question, throw one more in there for you, because uh, there are some rumors going around that veterans may not receive their compensation in October. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Under Secretary, I, I know me and you talked about this earlier. I just want to give yeah. you an opportunity to talk about that a little bit, the budget. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I think the Secretary mentioned earlier this morning, we're delivering more benefits to more veterans than at any other time in our history. For the last three years, we've broken all-time records in terms of total claims decided and total veteran benefits delivered. We're on track to do that for a fourth year in a row. We're, we've already completed more than two million claims and that was our record last year, 1.98 million. And we've got two more months to go. So as we're moving forward year over year, we're assessing what we've done and, and where we're going and we're setting very aggressive projections but notwithstanding the fact that we set those very aggressive projections, we are over-delivering on them. So we had initially projected that we would deliver 2.2 million claims decisions this fiscal year. Based on a reassessment done in June, we now believe we're on track to deliver 2.5 million claims decisions, wow. which is a massive, massive increase and a really good thing because we're serving more veterans. But what that means is, we have a risk of needing additional money to ensure we can pay all of those benefits on time. And we've estimated that to be about $3 billion. To put that into context, we pay more than, a little more than $3 billion in benefits every single week. So relatively close. And the, the, the basic issue here is uh, on a month-by-month -month basis, we start the payment process on September 20th. So we've told Congress, and we're working with the Office of Management and Budget, 
that we need to have those additional funds. These are dollars into the pockets of veterans. They pay for compensation and pension, as well as some education and, and VR and E payments. Uh, so that we have the multi-step process between sending the pay file to Treasury and then Treasury sending it to the banks and, and, and writing and getting the paper checks to ensure that we provide those benefits on time on October 1st. Every day past September 20th increases the risk that those payments will be delayed. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, yep. Uh, so very important, right? And again, there's, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about what's really happening. People are just hearing, well, we may not get our checks. Yeah, we, we will make sure, we're doing everything we can to uh, figure out how to uh, accelerate the, the payment timeline. Uh, I think the, the issue here is we have delivered more benefits to more veterans than even we thought was possible. And I think that's a good thing. And so as soon as we identified the issue, we wanted to make sure that we could communicate that clearly so we could take appropriate action. And I'll just say, um, I'll say this as well. There was always a risk that we, we would wind up in this situation, over-delivering. Uh, between the aggressive outreach and the increased hiring, we have both brought in a significant uh, a number of new claims, and we're delivering more claims than ever. But we know that when veterans have access to their earned benefits, they actually have a lower risk of suicide. So the risk is we could, uh, we could under deliver and take our foot off the gas to manage the budget and miss delivering someone their benefits and, and, and potentially contribute to uh, suicidal ideation. Or we could over deliver and have to come back and ask for more money. And every single time, if I was asked to make that decision, I will make the same decision. We're gonna over deliver for veterans. Excellent point, excellent point. I mean, that's why you're in the role you're in today. Yep. I mean, really, um, we certainly appreciate uh, both of you uh, coming and your time. I want to give each of you an opportunity to, if you have any closing remarks, uh, to make them. We'll start, Chairman. Well, number one, uh, uh, it's a good problem to have. It's better to have a problem that you're doing your job right, and as a result, you need to deliver the benefits that veterans have earned, than for you not to do your job, and veterans are left out. So I think uh, in this case, BBA is being a, a victim of their own success, but it's a good success because we want to take care of our veterans. Bottom line is, as you've heard, we're doing more than has ever been done before for veterans. The board is increasing its output, is reducing the inventory, both on legacy and AMA. We have, you know, at the beginning of last year, we had 41,000 original legacies that had never been heard. That number is now below 1,300. So legacy is on the rear view mirror. It's time to go all in on AMA. We're on it. Thank you for what each of you do. We're here to serve you. This is not about us. We're both doing this job because we want our country, we want our people, we want our veterans to be treated with the respect and receive the benefits that they've earned. So thank you for being our partners. Thank you for keeping us, uh, uh, you know, as I just said about Matt, John, and so many others that uh, Randy and the rest of the team letting us know when things need to be adjusted. That letter issue, that progress came in also because of uh, some concerns raised by DAV. So we're very uh, appreciative of your partnership and of your representation for our fellow veterans. Uh, and uh, I am humble uh, to serve in the role and to serve uh, partnering with, uh, with DAV uh, as we take care of our, uh, as the President says, our one truly sacred mission, which is to prepare those to, that go down range and to take care of them when they come back. Thank you so much. Thank you. We certainly appreciate it. <laughs> Under Secretary. Great. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to join you here today. Thanks for allowing us to partner with you uh, on the claims clinic. And so I hope if you haven't uh, uh, gone down there and checked it out, please do so and make sure you encourage anyone who needs to uh, file a claim or has a question to do so as well. Um, I was reflecting uh, on your first question, which was my history and kind of how I got into this. And I just wanted to say thank you, not only for your advocacy uh, on behalf of so many other veterans and helping us make the PACT Act a reality so that we could deliver more than 1.1 million PACT Act claims grants. But thank you personally, because when I started, 
Um, I was mentored and I sought out counsel and feedback and wisdom from the DAV team in Washington, and that was Joy and uh, John Bradley and, and yeah. Peter and, and so many others. And I have personally benefited from your experience, from your expertise, for, um, and, and from your veteran-centric approach. And so that has continued to guide me as I make decisions in this role. And I don't think anyone, myself, uh, at the top of the list would have ever assumed I would be in this role. But I think I have certainly benefited from the, um, the approach to issues that you, uh, that I see DAV take day in and day out. And so I'm gonna continue uh, leveraging that wisdom and counsel for as long as I'm lucky enough to be in this job and continuing to fight like hell for vets. So thanks very much. Well, we appreciate that. I mean, I, I, think, I think you guys have two of the hardest jobs in Washington, D.C. for sure. And, and it's a sacred mission what we get to do. It's a privilege to be able to help veterans and their families every single day. So it's a privilege to work alongside both of you all the time. And uh, anything we can do for you, we're here for you. So thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to have Joy and her guests come out. Please don't go anywhere. She'll yell at me if you guys leave. So she'll be right out here right now. And uh, thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, sir. So much. OK, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Again, I'm Joy Elam. I'm the National Legislative Director for DAV. And it's my pleasure to uh, moderate the second half of our panel this afternoon. And I'm really pleased to have with us two of our key leaders on uh, veterans health care. We have Representative Mark Takano. He is the ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. And Dr. Sharif El Nahal, our Under Secretary for Health uh, for the Department of Veterans Affairs. If everyone could just give them a warm welcome. A warm welcome. We're so excited to have this opportunity, and I just want to start with giving you both an opportunity to just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got um, interested in working with veterans. So I'll start with you, Representative Takano. Well, thank you, Joy. Um, well, I come from the 39th District of California, which includes March Air Reserve Base. We're not far from the old Norton Air Base. Uh, so the Inland Empire of Southern California has a very rich history of having a lot of veterans in our community. In fact, uh, Riverside County uh, oscillates between nine and 10%, actually a ninth or 10th largest veteran population by county uh, in the country. And so it was a natural that I would seek an assignment on the Veterans Affairs Committee where I have served since I've been in Congress. <clears throat> but there's an even bigger reason. Uh, I happened to be honored twice to go to the uh, 75th and 80th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. Uh, and it always brings to mind the service of my three great uncles on my father's side who fought in the 442nd Infantry Battalion in the segregated fighting unit, um, all Japanese American fighting unit. And one of my great uncles died in Massa, Italy, uh, just a few weeks before VE Day. Uh, even as their relatives, my mother and father and grandparents were in internment camps. And I always think of the, those segregated fighting units as one of the most poignant things about our country. And even though our country was not, has, has never been a perfect union, we're always striving to be a more perfect union. Uh, this is my way of paying it forward. Because uh, you know, the motto of the 442nd was go for broke, yeah. bet it all. And my great uncle bet it all. Uh, and uh, I think he won his bet because his his great nephew is a congressman today. That's a wonderful yeah, story. And I've worked with you for many years, uh, both as when you were chairman and now as ranking member. And uh, it's been a pleasure. You're a true advocate for veterans. And uh, I know that's always been first and foremost in your mind as you're um, doing your work up there on the committee. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Elena Hall. The question, same question for you. What led you to try to take on such an awesome responsibility? The Veterans uh, Health Administration is probably one of the toughest jobs out there. Um, the spotlight is always on VA. Um, and sometimes you get called before the committees and you have some fun with, you know, uh, 
uh, if there's a problem. So tell us, what led you to do that? What, what is your background in terms of wanting to serve veterans? Well, thanks very much, Joy, both for inviting me and inviting VA to be able to speak to veterans at this uh, really important convening and for the partnership of DAV. Uh, you and Randy are just incredible partners as we continue to advance the agenda to improve veterans' health care across the country. I also want to mention a word about uh, Shane Learman. He's also an incredible colleague, and uh, he's certainly uh, gone through a lot of difficulties uh, in recent days. And uh, my prayers are with him, uh, thinking of him, Lynn, Grayson, um, and you know his family uh, and everyone here. So um, you know, I'll just answer that question. There's a lot of reasons. I'll answer it with two stories. The first is a story. Uh, of my experience as a medical student and my very first clinical rotation. So most med schools, you do your first two years in the classroom, you do your final two years in clinical settings, hospitals and clinics. I was at the West Roxbury VA Medical Center emergency room in Boston. Very first patient I saw, patient number one, was an incredible vet, Gulf War vet, uh, who came in with crushing chest pain. And you know, I had just read textbooks and of course shadowed clinicians, but he had all sort of the textbook signs of a heart attack. And so of course I got my uh, boss doctor's attention, the attending uh, on record, I presented the patient. <clears throat> uh, while I was interviewing him, he told me that he had actually driven over an hour past multiple civilian hospitals with crushing chest pain, one arm on the steering wheel, another arm on his heart. Uh, to get to that emergency room. And so we asked him why he did that, and he told us he would never trust any other institution with his health care. Now, after we advised him to never do that again, um, it just became clear to us that, you know, this is an organization that does incredible things for people. It saves lives, but it also gives people who are the best among us, the people who wore the uniform, the cloth of our country, and defended our freedom, if we're doing that for people at a VA, then I would, I promised myself I would try to work for organizations for the rest of my life that did things like that for people who deserve it and have earned it so much. Second story, fast forward all the way to 2020, and um, we, I was running a hospital in Newark that was the sort of anchor hospital for the inner city uh, of Newark. We had 75% of the city's um, Residents went to the hospital for all sorts of reasons. Then a global pandemic started, and just like every other hospital in the New York metro area where the pandemic really first hit in America, we didn't know much about what was gonna come next. And so part of what happened was about a third of my nursing workforce and so many other of the healthcare personnel uh, either got COVID themselves or had a child or somebody they were caring for at home with the illness, and so we were understaffed by about a third in our hospital, all while the sickest patients we have seen in years are coming in all at once with a disease we knew little about. And so President Biden announced the deployment of both active duty and army reservist clinicians to go to civilian hospitals in the New York metro area and in some other parts of the country. And we were among the first five hospitals announced for that. I got to work with incredible women and men in uniform who saved people's lives in the community we were serving and also saved our hospital. And when the commanding officer of that unit was about to leave, I asked him, what can I possibly do to repay you guys? They integrated with our team. They dove into an uncertain setting and just kicked ass as people in uniform usually do in this country. And they did extraordinary life-saving work. And his answer to me, was, I know you worked at the VA before, this was my second stint at VA, um, go back to VA and, and serve veterans again. Find a way to serve veterans again. And so I think uh, it's full circle for me, being able to serve incredible heroes every day in this job and try to make their life and health better. Well, both of those are a great story and you've been um, an incredible advocate for veterans and uh, really a pleasure working with you as well since you've been the undersecretary, but we appreciate um, all you do. We know how hard that work is and uh, the, again, the incredible responsibility to care for our nation's veterans and, and take that all on. Um, 
I'd like to just set the stage a little bit. One of the things I think you've heard DAV speak about is that, um, you know, as an organization of wartime service disabled veterans, uh, we have a, a high usage, we're our members high users of the VA healthcare system. They really need, depend, rely on it. Many of them have been injured or become ill and have, li have life changing, um, you know, health issues that uh, they require the care of the VA, the very specialized care that VA provides. And we really, as an organization, have a vested interest in making sure the longevity of the VA healthcare system for future generations of our nation's veterans. And so, um, you know, you've heard us say, we wanna make sure that VA is the primary provider and coordinator of veterans care. And with that, um, you know, I want to give you an opportunity just as we start out to kind of give us what is the state of VA in your opinion today? What are the trust scores for veterans? What are the, um, you know, the patient satisfaction rates for veterans? Well, thanks, Joy. I mean, uh, I'll start off by saying we always have work to do to make our system better. There are parts of our healthcare system that are not yet meeting the mark for what veterans expect and what they've earned with their service to the nation. And so by no means, what I'm gonna say now, uh, certainly uh, is meant to indicate that we don't have things to improve upon. And we actually have an initiative for quality and patient safety called High Reliability with a central mantra that we are never done trying to improve our system. All of that said, the thing we are most proud of on our performance is what veterans are telling us about how we are doing for their care. And we measure trust every single time a veteran goes to one of our outpatient clinics. They get a survey. We have a much higher response rate than the private sector on that survey, 30% or higher response rate every year. And as of the last report card we got on that, 91.8% of veterans across the country say they trust VA for the outpatient care that they're receiving. On top of that, we just got data in, latest and greatest, on the overall hospital quality star ratings and the patient experience star ratings that CMS uses to compare directly between VA and the private sector. You can actually go to your website now for the overall hospital quality star rating. Go to any region of the country uh, and search all the hospitals in that area. The VA hospitals will be there with the same rating system as compared to private sector. So as of the last set of results, 67% of VA medical centers scored either four or five stars on the overall star rating. And just in, 78% of VA medical centers score either four or five stars on the patient experience star rating, compared to only about 42% of civilian sector hospitals. And so the most important report card we get is from veterans themselves, and we are seeing all-time high trust scores in VA healthcare. I mentioned the overall hospital quality star rating. That's a, a reflection of not just what veterans' <coughs> feedback is, but also standard measures on things like patient safety issues, uh, whether you know, the hospital is a comfortable and safe environment for veterans, life safety issues, everything that you might think of, and we score extraordinarily well. And then, of course, on access, we have had Obviously, geographic and uh, major issues with access in VA's history in the past. I don't need to remind folks about the major issues uncovered 10 years ago, about uh, wait times and how they were uh, in some places being fabricated. No longer is that even possible based on our data systems, but most importantly, year over year, we're actually seeing improvements in wait times for veteran care. So a reduction on average by 8% in average primary care wait times and for mental health, we've reduced them by almost 10% compared to last year. And that's because we're delivering more appointments than we ever have in our history. We are on track to deliver 127 million appointments this year. 20% increase just over last year on primary care appointments. 15% increase on mental health appointments. The average wait time for a new patient in mental health is about 19 days. We want it to be shorter. But I can tell you the average in the private sector is way longer than that for mental health. And so we are trying on all cylinders to keep improving. We're never gonna be satisfied, but I think on average we keep getting closer to meeting the mark. Thank you. Representative Takano, you are always on the road. I know you just came <laughs> from, I think, Minnesota. Uh, you were doing a round table up there. 
you are always talking with veterans as well. What is your impression? Um, what do veterans tell you? What kind of feedback are you getting um, about the VA healthcare system? You know, most of the veterans that I talk to on the whole have good things to say about the VA, how much they like it, uh, how it works better for them, and they plead with me, don't let the VA be hollowed out. And uh, I just want to make a comment where I think the system is right now, to, speak, to be frank. Uh, I've been alarmed over the last three or four years at the rate at which community care referrals um, and the cost of community care has grown. So, so let's be clear that both direct care inside the VA has grown, as Dr. Elnaha has said, unprecedented amount uh, of growth, due in part because of uh, the success of the PACT Act. We have 400,000 newly eligible veterans uh, for VA healthcare because of the PACT Act, and it means peace of mind to those veterans that uh, are finding out they have cancers and other very serious diseases, peace of mind for them and their families. Uh, over 1.1 million veterans have had their claims approved. Uh, unprecedented numbers of, uh, of uh, VBA benefits being approved. Uh, I want to make sure that going into the future, that VHA and direct care is there for uh, future veterans. Uh, but we're at an inflection point. I do think we're at an inflection point where every dollar going out into community care is going to mean less direct care. Uh, and community care is often more expensive. Uh, and so I'm encouraging Dr. Elna Hall and the secretary uh, to get their arms around a strategy uh, to uh, get some cost controls on community care. I am not in a crusade against community care. It is necessary, uh, it is necessary for VA to be able to deliver health care to all our veterans, but it's got to be the right balance, and it's growing at a rate that's unsustainable. Now, I want to talk about my trip to Minnesota because about 5% of community care costs is due to oncology or cancer treatments. And I had heard about uh, this program uh, called Close to Me, and I'll let Dr. Elnahal talk more about it. The secretary has done a, uh, a press conference on it, but I wanna kinda challenge them to do more. Uh, and I think the people at the VA, uh, at the DAV, should know about this program because I think once they hear about it, they're gonna to wanna to demand that it happens in their community. So what is close to me? Mainly if you're a rural veteran, live in a rural area, or you're in a suburban area like mine where you have a bunch of sea box, uh, where it's difficult to go get a cancer infusion. Uh, you, you, you're diagnosed with cancer, you need a cancer infusion. Uh, if you're a rural veteran, if you're referred out into the community, you're likely to have to drive a long distance anyway uh, to go find that place that can, uh, can do the, the injection, uh, local, if, even if it's local. So get this, everybody knows that VA negotiates with the drug companies and we get lower drug prices. Think about cancer drugs and how likely those innovative cancer drugs are gonna be expensive. VA gets a substantial discount. Whenever we refer a cancer patient out into the community, uh, that means there's a huge markup on that drug. Uh, and that costs VA millions of dollars it doesn't necessarily have to spend. So what, I, what the folks done in Minnesota, they have figured out a way to train LPNs and other folks in, these, in the C-Box to give the drugs to the veterans, to administer the drugs, uh, saving both in administration fees and saving also in, uh, uh, in drug costs. That's only 5%. We've got a bigger percent of the, of the budget, of the, of the, of the uh, community care budget, which is devoted to, to, to emergency healthcare. Uh, that's a much more complicated thing that's gonna involve Congress. Um, uh, I'm committed, should I get my gavel back? That this is a major priority for me. A major priority for me is to make sure that the PACT Act gets implemented in such a way that we guarantee a cost-effective way to deliver high quality care to all our veterans. And that means getting the right balance between uh, community care and direct care. 
Well, we definitely think that is essential. Community care, um, Congress is authorized with the Choice Act, the Mission Act, expanded that. And we know that at times VA may not be able to provide a certain service or they can't provide it in a timely way. So community care is essential care. Um, and we know that we have, as you mentioned, rural veteran. Um, we, VA's really done, um, it, I mean, there's still a struggle with this. You know, rural communities, um, you know, struggle, have a number of unique challenges trying to get access to health care. And, you know, we've seen this significant increase in VA. Um, and in fact, uh, Dr. Elnahal, you um, uh, commissioned a report, which is often referred to now as the Red Team Report. And when we read it, like you, um, I think there's some alarming things, at least that really got our attention in there. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about um, this increasing um, uh, number of you know referrals to the community, but at the same time, I know you've told us there's the same for demand for direct care. And again, finding that balance is going to be critical, and I do agree that um, VA is really at an inflection point. So we're glad that you um, commissioned this red team, and they had some really national, you know, former undersecretaries for health, Dr. Kaiser, Dr. Perlin, and other, um, uh, of, in, you know, well-known folks in healthcare. Could you just tell our membership a little bit about that, why you did that? and um, we can talk about some of those comments that they've made in the report. Yeah, thank you, Joy. I'm happy to speak to that. And, you know, uh, much of what Representative Takano mentioned, we've had these conversations, uh, Congressman, and um, we know that this has been an issue that's been discussed, especially since the pandemic, when uh, a lot of care had to, out of necessity, be referred into the community because a lot of our operations had to shut down and otherwise become unavailable to veterans during that public health crisis. Uh, the inflection point that made me want to get an outside view, and remember this is an outside group that we asked to opine and issue recommendations and really just assess this question of do we have the right balance of care, but more importantly, what do we do about all of this growth and demand <clears throat> for veteran care that we expected and hoped to see from the PACT Act. Representative Takano just mentioned 710,000 new veterans enrolled, 34% higher uh, since in the, compared to the two years before the PACT Act. Uh, also, more than 800,000 veterans because of all of the incredible work you just heard Under Secretary Jacobs mention about them processing claims at a faster clip than ever before. More than 800,000 vets who weren't necessarily service connected or who may have been at lower percentages all of a sudden found themselves in the priority group one through three domain. Priority group one qualifying for long-term care, qualifying for dental care, qualifying for beneficiary travel. All these great things that make VA an even more attractive healthcare system as an option for them. So how do we deal with all of that in the context of discretionary budget caps, which we saw for the first time in a long time negotiated so that the country would not default in June of 2023. And so this was a tough set of challenges um, against the discretionary budget caps with all of these trends happening, just like Josh mentioned in the previous session. We were always going to index on getting as many veterans into the system as possible, no matter what, meaning we accelerated Section 103 of the PACT Act. Now every single veteran who is exposed to anything during their service in the form of a toxic substance every deployed post 9-11 veteran, every deployed Gulf War veteran, every deployed Vietnam veteran in a vast majority of locations during that conflict now directly qualifies for VA healthcare. And now more than 40,000 vets since March 5th alone, when we accelerated that, have enrolled. We always made the decision to say, let's open the doors as wide as possible in the VA, because that's the right thing to do for every single <coughs> veteran, knowing that, for example, suicide risk is highest for veterans who are not tethered to VA when you compare pound for pound on risk. So this is a tough set of questions that we asked them to comment on, and they came back with a pretty clear answer. That unless there is significant policy and operational efforts to make sure that we maximize VA offerings for care whenever we can, but still have the community as an important backstop, 
uh, the VA risks having unsustainably high budget needs when we all don't always have an environment where the discretionary budget is unlimited. In other words, not capped. It is capped right now. I will say that for four years in a row, we have been asking for the VA budget to be in its own separate third category, similar to DOD's budget. And the reason that the president's been pushing for that is pretty simple. If we're gonna consider our defense mission to be sacred and not to be held against any other discretionary agency comparisons, then the mission to care for veterans after they come home should be equally sacred and should not be held to a cap that other agencies have to fix. So if we achieve that third budget category, then a lot of these issues become a little bit easier. But nonetheless, it's important to sustain the VA healthcare system for the veterans who need it the most. And frankly, DAV's members are exactly those veterans. Higher levels of service connection, higher levels of disability, and unique services that only the VA can offer oftentimes. We need to preserve the system as much as possible in as many parts of the system as possible for the very mission of meeting what those veterans need. Our spinal cord injury system of care is the prime example of that. You will find nothing comparable in the private sector. And that is the way it should be because vets who get catastrophically injured during their service require and deserve that this country do everything possible for them when they come home and meet every single need they have for their disability. And so what are we doing about it? Well, just over the last year, we have operationally oriented ourselves that whether or not a veteran qualifies for the community under the law, and by the way, we will continue and have been still growing community care more than 15% year over year compared to last year. That's an extremely high rate of growth. Growth like that will probably continue. But what I've told all of our teams is also offer that VA option side by side at every opportunity you have so that the veteran is in the driver's seat making the decision. I've heard that veterans, yeah. we have a pretty easy way for our teams to say you qualify under the Mission Act, here's a bunch of options in the community. We didn't have a system or processes to make it equally easy to say, but guess what, here's your telehealth option, here's your in-person option, here's a caregiver support program option for your long-term care needs. All the different things that VA offers should be offered side by side with the veteran in the driver's seat. And that's what we're taking away from this report. Thank you. Representative Takano, you, um, in Congress, this has been a big issue. And it seems like there's tug and pull on, on different sides of the aisle with regard to community care. And I think Dr. Elnahal has really pointed out, um, because there's been a lot of discussion, and, and I don't know if it's happening in some locations, but you know we'll hear uh, VA's pulling back. They're trying to have people come into the system. They're not allowing them to go into the community. And again, I think there's a difference between what you've just indicated, being an informed consumer of healthcare. You know, VA brings a lot to the table in terms of its quality and evidence-based treatments and its care coordination, which in turn result in better health outcomes. And I think just as a consumer of VA care, I mean, I wanna be informed, you know, where am I gonna get the best care for the particular condition I'm dealing with? And we know VA has expertise in certain things like mental health. Um, but in Congress, we're really hearing this back and forth on community care. I think a lot of it stems from these rural, a, a number of members in the both committees are from rural communities. And they have a different experience with the members in those communities and that they're hearing from. And I hope that Congress is able to have this discussion. I don't know that we've uh, really had VA up to talk about the Red Team Report. And I just wanna mention um, like one of these comments that are in there that um, rising costs will decrease funds available for the direct care system absent a corresponding increase in VHA funding. This could mean eliminating certain direct care services or closing VA facilities or access points of care. And again, that's something that DAV's been talking about uh, for some time now 
when we started to see the advent of community care. You know, we said, great, it's necessary to expand it, but we always need to maintain the VA healthcare system. It is a unique system. It is focused on service disabled, veterans, war-related injuries and illnesses, and the research that VA is doing is second to none, and that no one in the community has a vested interest in doing. Um, so, you know, VA knows its patients better, the complexity of the care that's out there. So what do you say to your, uh, you know, your colleagues who are really saying, you know, uh, veterans can get just as good of care in the community, um, and that's what they want. So they should be able to go there uh, without any, you know, without any um, burden or barrier. Well, I don't know of any any healthcare system that doesn't sort of have this idea of a network inside and network outside and network. Uh, if you're in a private healthcare system right. uh, like I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna pay more for an out-of-network doctor, a lot more. If I go to an out-of-network hospital, a lot more. Uh, when I was facing a kidney stone uh, a couple years ago in Las Vegas, I was worried about which emergency room I was gonna to go to because I was worried that that emergency room was not in my network. Uh, not every consumer out there will think about this when they have an emergency. Uh, uh, and so I called the uh, speak to our nurse function on my care first uh, plan. Uh, and say, well, what should I do? Should I go to the, to the emergency, emergent care um, uh, facility or should I go to emergency room? Uh, so it's, it's, it's complicated for everybody. But VA, uh, I don't think we can be under the illusion that VA can operate under, that we pay for everything, uh, that, uh, that any provider out there can charge VA whatever it wants. By the way, that's kind of what's happening in some cases with emergency care right now because of the way that uh, VA has made uh, uh, itself the payer first instead of a secondary payer, uh, you know, uh, VA pays first. Now there are ways to approach this, um, which I think we can put veterans in, a, in, a, in the best of all places, but we, we do have to be smart and manage the, the situation. That's why I was talking about programs like Close to Me, <coughs> which by the way means that the VA is making it easier for you to go get a cancer infusion uh, at your local CBOC instead of having to drive three hours away to get that cancer infusion. And you pay the VA contracted rate with the pharmaceutical uh, far less money. VA should do more of that and I want all the DAV chapters out there to ask themselves, do we have a cancer, do we have a close to me facility in my community? And get your congressperson mm -hmm. to demand that VA get one in your community because uh, that is going to, I think, pave the way uh, for cancer treatment, not, so, not just for veterans, but it's going to set a model for everybody in rural communities. Uh, in many cases, uh, specialists are not available in a rural community either. VA is on the forefront of making sure that intensive care people, uh, other kinds of specialists, uh, they're pioneering uh, telehealth care uh, in these areas. And I want to push VA to do more of that. But where we can, I think, get the biggest savings is in this whole, and I read, and it's in the Red Team report, is in 30% uh, of community care costs are in emergency services. Uh, and I realize that the population that VA serves older veterans with more complicated uh, hist uh, 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 medical circumstances, uh, they often have to go to the emergency room. But there's more, there's, there are many more ways in which VA can manage, manage emergency services more carefully. But Congress needs to get involved uh, in making sure that, say, a, social, a, a Medicare and VA eligible uh, recipient, uh, that, that, that Medicare maybe pays first and that we take care of any co-pays uh, for that veteran so that uh, there's no out-of-pocket cost for the veteran, but that VA is not stuck with the entire emergency room bill. And then we also have to work with some of these uh, uh, healthcare providers that take advantage, uh, that we find ways to make sure that uh, we can repatriate or, or steer those emergency room 
cases to VA, and that's 30% of all VA community care costs. That's a lot of money, and, that, and there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, I was talking to Dr. Alano. Dr. Alano, you might want to just talk about how much you think, you, you gave me a number about how much you thought we could save if we implemented some emergency uh, health care uh, provisions. Um, what was that amount, a couple billion, three or four billion dollars? Yeah, it, it's, def it's definitely at least over a billion dollars, and uh, we would insist upon, as you mentioned, Congressman, uh, making sure that whatever policy changes we made didn't result in uh, accidental billing or more billing of veterans directly if a veteran doesn't know whether they're going to the ER because they have a service-connected condition or not. Uh, veterans often should not, should never, in my view, be thinking about that when seeking emergency care, wherever that care is. Uh, but we see that as a potential policy discussion to have with you and the other members of the committee. Here's what I want to say. Um, in, the, in the past two years, as this crisis has been building, and I, I think it is, it's an inflection point at very least, crisis may, I think crisis is an apt word. I'm worried about the future of, of direct care at the VA. Precisely the reason for your members, uh, who are the most vulnerable veterans. Uh, we, we, my Republican colleagues have not held a single hearing on oversight of community care. And, and that's the other point about community care. Community care does not have the level of scrutiny that care in the VA does have. We're not making sure that community care providers are coming up to the same standards as VA. The records aren't necessarily returned. Uh, the comprehensive way in which health care is delivered uh, is compromised by the fact that all that doesn't work as, as it should. There needs to be far more oversight of, of this, and members of Congress, we should have been holding more hearings on this. If I get my gavel back, when I get my gavel back, uh, this will be a major emphasis of mine uh, to make sure that we provide that oversight and we implement and have roundtables, including DAV at the table, to figure out how do we drive uh, cost savings without compromising uh, the quality of care for veterans. Right. I think the, one of the really important points you just made is that you know VA does pride itself on um, providing veterans the soonest and best care. And one thing the Red Team report uh, members have have indicated is that um, they the community care providers have not are not required to de demonstrate competency in understanding military culture or treating complex health care needs of veterans, which is often, again, um, really relates to health outcomes for veterans. And they're not required to make wait times and quality care data publicly available like VA does. And I know we've asked you about that many times because we felt that that was really supposed to be part and parcel of the Mission Act, that you want to make sure as a veteran, if I'm being referred to the community because I can't get a timely appointment in VA, that I'm going to a quality provider that's going to know about this veteran experience, especially if I'm going for a mental health mm -hmm. um, a appointment with PTSD or you know uh, something that you know you want to make sure that that's the right person. Um, but yet they've really resisted that in terms of you being able to get them to be network providers, meeting the same quality standards, and it isn't always that the soonest appointment can be in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the community providers as well for specialty appointments, there can be long waits. And so having a really informed discussion with that veteran is just not happening in some cases where they can you know, know that, hey, I got referred to the community, I guess that's where I'm going, rather than like you said, um, Here's what we have in VA. Here's what we have in another VA nearby. Here's all your options and the quality of the care. You want to know about that. Can I, can I say a little more about that, Joy? Uh, I, it's, I always felt it was unfair that we put on the VA publisher wait times, uh, and VA is the only one that has to do it. Right. Um, I've got my own staffers who are in private health care plans in California, the congressional, uh, the federal health plan. They're complaining to me about not being able to get an appointment. Uh, at, you know, in the community uh, for any number of reasons. Um, I think it's high time that every American, when they enroll uh, in a health plan during open enrollment, 
they should be able to know what is the wait time to go see an oncologist. They should be able to know uh, who's in their network and how long it would take to go see them. Um, when we get that in place, well, look, I don't want to make it conditional on that, but I, I do think it's unfair that yes. uh, a veteran can't really have visibility into how long, if they refer to the community, how long is it going to take? Because often it could take as long or longer. Mm -hmm. And the health outcome for the particular uh, thing that they're trying to get done mm -hmm. may not be as good. May, uh, VA may have a better track record uh, for this. And we all know from objective uh, kind of records from CMS. So that's the kind of choice, that's the real choice for the veteran. That's a right. real choice for the veteran, which they don't quite have now. Right. And, you know, since VA has really been dedicated, one of their most highest clinical priorities is the reduction of suicide. Mm -hmm. And we're still struggling with that as a nation. It's not just a veteran problem, but veterans definitely have higher rates of suicide compared to our civilian counterparts. And one thing we've thought is definitely unfair. We know VA providers go through mandated training for suicide prevention, lethal means counseling, and a number of things you've instituted but these are not required of these community providers. And again, we want every clinician who sees a veteran to be on guard for that, to be looking and to be asking. Um, that's essential to bringing that suicide rate down. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, if, if I could on this, Joy, I, I think you're both uh, completely on point in this discussion. Uh, I will concede that we have higher standards on pretty much everything than the private sector does for veteran care. And that's exactly where we should be. We have a report card on quality and patient safety that has many more metrics than the star ratings that I mentioned to you earlier that every hospital is held to. It includes mental health quality. It includes outpatient uh, metrics that the other one doesn't have. It includes patient satisfaction much more robustly. We're proud of that and we are beating the private sector even with that higher standard. Yes, we do publish wait times transparently and accurately for every single one of our clinics and settings across the country to make sure veterans know exactly what their wait time will be. And we will continue doing that even though the private sector will never do that unless they are forced. Uh, nonetheless, there are things that we can do at VA to make those things easier. So one example. We're instituting something called external provider scheduling. External provider scheduling is a technology that we've implemented in a couple of visions. We're expanding it to six visions soon that with the cooperation for some of our highest volume community partners, and remember, we have some great partners in the private sector who coordinate with us, who get us records back on time. Uh, not every provider sort of falls into that, uh, what essentially is the majority of the situation, which is delaying, sending records back, et cetera. Some of them are great partners. Those partners are directly connecting to our scheduler systems with new technology for us to be able to schedule directly. As part of that, we can start to see what the actual wait time is in terms of number of days for those community appointments. Uh, the most successful pilot of this has been in Columbia, South Carolina, where we can have an apples to apples comparison and tell the veteran, you can get care in the community because you qualify under the Mission Act, it's 35 days to get that GI appointment. In the VA, it's 30 days, which is why you qualify, but it's a shorter time. And the veteran can make an informed choice. They might want to choose the community option anyway, but it's that veteran's choice. So we're going forward with technology to help us do that. I announced an interoperability pledge with 13 health systems. Again, very engaged health systems like Sanford Health in North and South Dakota. Uh, which has already identified tens of thousands of vets in their system who could qualify for the PACT Act through interoperable exchange of health information with modern technology. So that's one set of things we're doing. Uh, the other set of things we're doing is we're looking at some of the absurd things that we do. So in North Carolina, for example, a number of vets who live on the coast uh, and their market is the Durham VA. Uh, we hand them community care authorizations and say there's a GI appointment at Duke when Duke is the same drive time as the Durham VA. <laughs> so we just have to be clear that there's also a VA option that is probably quicker and will be the same drive time, even if we're offering that because they qualify for drive time. So it's these operational things that we have to focus on too. 
What are you doing about um, hiring? Um, we know that's critical to having timely access to care, and we know there's shortages of healthcare personnel across the country and specialty, but nurses and you know the people that make our systems run. Um, what is VA doing to expand hours? I mean, you know, I know you've done talked about access prints. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we hired more clinicians than any time in VA history in fiscal year 2023. We hired a total of more than 61,000 uh, VA employees, new employees into the system. There, more than 30,000 of those employees were the real sort of frontline, uh, most critical jobs where we had shortages. So nurses, doctors, food service workers, housekeeping aides, the folks who make clinics and hospitals move. Now many more of that 61,000 were also frontline, but we identified what we called the big seven occupations where we were most short, including medical schedulers, by the way, uh, medical support assistants. And we hired more of them than at any other time in history, including more nurses than any other time in history. And so we knew we had the capacity to see many more patients going into this fiscal year. And that's what underpinned the access sprints. So the access sprints was a way to hold us accountable for seeing the maximum number of veterans and delivering the highest ever volume of appointments than any time before. And so that involved scheduling more veterans into your standard clinic day without compromising the time we're spending with each veteran. So by the way, we don't wanna be at private sector productivity, otherwise you'll end up with you know, the 10 minute primary care appointments that I get as a civilian. Um, and so that was part of it, but I think the more innovative pieces of it where we saw uh, night clinics, weekend clinics open, the secretary gave an example of that this morning in his speech, um, you know, uh, more telehealth coming out of our clinical resource hubs and the visions, and more opportunities to say to a veteran, well, you can get this appointment, it doesn't have to be at this particular VA, as long as it's a convenient drive time for you, we can offer it to you at another VA. We are up more than 30% and what we call inter-facility consults, referrals not from the VA to the community, but from one VA hospital to another VA hospital. A lot of veterans are taking us up on that because of the quality, and as you mentioned, veteran-centeredness and competency on military culture that makes our trust score so high. Great. Um, I think one of the most, you know, things that uh, is worrisome um, for DAV is that people don't recognize the VA healthcare system and what really makes the VA healthcare system it, you know, so special. One of those things is research, um, VA's education of our nation's clinicians, and the fourth mission, which we really learned during this uh, past COVID crisis, um, how important having capacity within a healthcare system extra because in the community for private, uh, I mean for profit, um, that does not, you know, fly with them. They are working on very, you know, exactly what they need, but um, that is part of VA's, um, you know, one of their important missions that often gets overlooked. And I think that's also something critical to um, think about. I, I guess the most worrisome thing was um, that the red team report members concluded was that the, you know, this rising cost in community care and referrals to the community without this discussion, without really thinking through, could be an existential threat to the VA healthcare system. And that is worrisome. So I'm really hoping we can get the commitment from you both of you to try to work together between VA and Congress, and I know you are not the chairman right now, but <laughs> I know you hold a lot of sway, and that you will work hard to try to get us all talking and at the same table to I'm, talk about these issues openly. I'm so thankful that you're bringing this topic up. It's long been uh, the thing that's, I mean, the, after the jubilation of passing the PACT Act, uh, the next thing on my plate if I, if I ever get to drive the discussion with a gavel again, uh, is staffing uh, and direct care capacity, making sure we have the right balance. I, I pledge to you if I get my gavel back, or if I don't, 
uh, that I will continue uh, to uh, do what I can to get things in the right balance, uh, to push uh, you know, uh, my, my colleagues uh, at, uh, on the administration side, Dr. Ellen Hall and Secretary uh, McDonough, uh, to really dig deep into uh, th this, uh, this looming crisis for VA. Uh, that being said, I will finish my comment on this note. I, I want to really thank Dr. Allen Hall and Secretary McDonough and President Biden for implementing the, PAC, uh, the Compact Act. So we have the PACT Act and the Compact Act. Uh, you probably have the latest statistics on the number of, uh, the last statistic I heard is over 60,000 veterans have used the Compact Act, which is an astounding number to me. Yep. Uh, and what is the Compact Act? The Compact Act was every veteran, regardless of their eligibility for VA health care, so the 20 million veterans out there, uh, even those not enrolled in VA, if they have an emergency mental health episode, they can call 988, dial one, get connected with a VA counselor, and then get connected to emergency mental health care and not have to worry about the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an important new tool. Uh, if folks haven't ha heard about it, 988, press one. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allen, do you have the latest numbers on how many veterans are using this? Yeah, it's over. It's well over 60,000 vets at this point who have benefited from this by uh, going to an emergency room, not uh, being enrolled or perhaps not enrolled uh, in VA healthcare. And if they're not enrolled, uh, we will still pay for their acute care episode, any follow-up care, including a hospitalization for up to 30 days, again, whether or not they're enrolled in VA healthcare. And if they need outpatient follow-up appointments for mental health or otherwise, we will pay for that for up to 90 days. So this is a policy that we announced earlier this year, thanks to Congress, thanks to you, Representative Takano, for authorizing us to do this. Remember that we consider our mission our most important clinical priority, our most important public health priority, which is to prevent veteran suicide. We consider that to be VA's mission, alongside all of you, for every veteran in America, not just veterans who are tethered to VA. Every single veteran deserves our efforts, whether uh, you know, we have to, op of course, operate within the law and what we can do, but there's nothing in the law preventing us from doing unprecedented outreach programs like this are explicitly authorized by the law, but that suicide prevention report we release every year includes every veteran who dies by suicide, not just veterans who are connected to VA. There are more than 6,000 veterans in 2021 who died by suicide. If we're not learning from every single one of those veterans to prevent that next veteran from doing so, then we are not doing our jobs. The data in those reports makes clear, though, that when veterans do enroll in VA healthcare, and especially when veterans file their claims and get compensation and pension benefits, the risk for suicide goes down. So if there's one reason, in my view, to take away for preserving the VA and its <laughs> mission, it is because veterans are most protected as long as they get a responsive and helpful VA on the other end coming to their assistance. And we have to work on making sure that's more consistent over time, but the data is quite clear on that. And so the efforts to make sure that the VA healthcare system is strong, that its capacity is growing, and now we have the PACT Act, so even more vets are gonna be enrolling and even more vets are gonna get service connection. We need to preserve that system and strengthen it moving forward. Yep. Well, we know it's been disappointing that the suicide rates have not you know, come down. But um, I think it's very hard to gauge how many lives were saved um, through the Compact Act, um, expansion of that, trying to do better in terms of access, um, you know, and timely access when someone needs it. Um, there's always a media story, um, you know, when there's a failure, and I know that's a huge, um, you know, weight on your shoulders. I know that the VA employees, and I hope you'll share with them, because we hear from our membership all the time, uh, you know, VA saved my life. And uh, we just did a, a visit here at the hospital, uh, the VA Medical Center. We came in a little early, and we were just doing a little tour, and a veteran saw, you know, he didn't know who we were. We didn't have any signs on or anything. 
but he basically said, I just want to say I'm getting the greatest care here. I got my knees fixed. I got my hearing aids. I got my glasses. I'm good to go, and I'm 84. And we were like, great. You know, that was, <laughs> it was a good story. Um, we know not everybody has a good story, and there are difficult um, challenges um, ahead that need to always be addressed. Uh, we want to be part of the solution, and we, you know, we're in a tough uh, position right now in, t in terms of an election year. Always things get a little crazy in Washington, uh, but we're really going to be asking. Our members are going to be going out and talking about we have a vision for veterans uh, for the 119th Congress, um, which is a document they're going to be talking about with their, their um, officials that are, again, running for office during this election period. And we really want to make sure that um, every you know person really understands what it means, the service, the sacrifice, and the aftermath of, of military service. Um, with toxic exposures, we just continue to learn more and more. We've got another toxic exposure report that's coming out in September, ending the wait, um, which is saying, although we passed the PACT Act and that's a great achievement, there's still much more to do. There's oh. always people that are feeling left out um, and we can't have that. And I, we thank the secretary for mentioning our Women Veterans Report. And again, sometimes we have tough words for VA and tough recommendations, but uh, we tell it like it is. You know, we share with you the good, the bad, and what we think, um, you know, needs to happen going forward. And I, I hope we can get the commitment again from uh, both of you to work together to try and get your colleagues to say this is important for veterans. You know, we have to put all this other noise aside and really focus on what is best for them. And I know we're uh, coming up to the end of our time here. Um, I just want to give you each a quick opportunity to, you know, say anything maybe that we missed, we didn't have a chance to talk about. There was so much more um, we could we could spend uh, uh, all day, but we know how busy your schedules are. We appreciate you making the time, the effort to be here, spend a little bit of time with uh, DAV members and see what our organization is all about. And um, I think we're all on the same page that we all want the same thing, which is uh, to do right do right by our, our nation's veterans and their families and survivors. So, Dr. Ellen Hall, I'll let you make some closing comments. Thank you, Joy. And uh, listen, your uh, partnership, but also oversight and holding us accountable, your partnership and oversight as well, Representative Nakano, uh, have made us better over time and will continue to make us better. And that includes everybody in this room. Uh, our VSO partners help us with the mission. You're also calling us when we're not doing things right. And that makes us better. And the first thing I'll say is I invite more and more of that so that we can accelerate how much we're improving. Uh, I do want to tie an earlier topic that we discussed into what the Secretary addressed directly this morning, which was uh, our communication to Congress that we have a projected need for more funds into the next fiscal year. Again, we are on track to complete more than 127 million appointments this year between the staff we've brought on who've now increased productivity and delivered 20% more primary care appointments, 15% more mental health appointments, more prosthetics than ever before. About half of vets in our system require some form of prosthetic, whether it's a really complex prosthetic limb or simply eyeglasses, hearing aids, some of the more simple items. About half of our vets need prosthetics. The costs of those are going up. Pharmaceutical costs continue to go up, but also the introduction of really effective but expensive obesity drugs and other elements that have made our pharmacy costs higher. That accounts for about 3.8 billion of the 12 that we requested to be able to meet all of veterans' needs. The main story and the main reason we've come forward transparently on this is, to say, is because of the fact that we're delivering more care to veterans than ever before and we're projecting a need to deliver even more of that care next year because we did everything we could to open the doors into the system. As Josh mentioned, we could have decided not to do as much outreach as we could have to get that additional veteran enrolled. We could have decided to not accelerate faster than the law required, eligibility under Section 103, but we did those things because it was the right thing to do for veterans, and that was in consultation with VSOs, 
and veterans themselves. And we always knew that that could place a risk, but rather than placing that risk on the veteran, we're placing that risk on the budget. And now we're making clear to everybody that veterans need more investment into the next fiscal year, and that is the story behind that request. And so, as you said, Joy, I hope that this is met swiftly and, of course, with due diligence, as Congress always does uh, in these situations, as they should. Uh, but uh, my hope is that we can have this discussion based on policy and merit and what veterans need uh, as the anchor for what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Takano, I hope you will, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, we have H.R. 8371, the Elizabeth Dole uh, um, Act, um, 21st Century Act uh, pending. Um, it really is an accumulation of all the work, you know, uh, that we've testified on. Uh, there's so many good pieces of legislation um, that are combined in the omnibus bill. And I hope that the Congress will, um, the committees will find a way forward. I know that you've expressed, you know, some concern and you've met with our leadership and, and the VSO leadership, but, um, you know, this is an important bill that we think is, is, is got to find a way forward. I, I would agree with you. Um, and uh, it's, frankly, uh, my Republican colleagues uh, have not been able to bring the bill to the floor. Uh, they have not been able to bring it through the Rules Committee. Uh, Senator Tester uh, uh, hopefully uh, is going to be successful in hotlining uh, the, 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 I think the salient bills for your members, which is the Home Act, uh, as well as the Elizabeth Home Care Act. Uh, within, they've, they've broadly named this whole package, uh, and there's a, there's a serious section of the bill that deals with uh, expanding the aperture of uh, community care that I'm very concerned with. Uh, and I think my concern is not misplaced, given uh, what uh, the Undersecretary and the Secretary have uh, made known about uh, the next fiscal year's challenge uh, with uh, funding uh, the VHA. So uh, there is wide consensus on a big chunk of that bill, uh, but uh, I, I do not uh, uh, regret my concern, voice of my concern over the part of the bill that, that would significantly expand uh, community care and make it more difficult uh, to uh, find that right balance between community care and uh, uh, direct care. Let me, uh, let me uh, kind of move on to uh, kind of my concluding statement, uh, which is it was the honor of a lifetime uh, to work with you and other VSO leaders and uh, the members of your organization uh, in passing the PACT Act almost two years ago. Uh, it was an incredibly profound decision that President Biden made uh, to not phase in implementation when he signed the bill. Uh, when he signed the bill, he said he wanted to implement it all now. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that has caused us some challenges that we are feeling presently with uh, the acceleration of uh, benefits. I mean, it's, I don't think it's unfair to say that a big chunk of our challenge with the VBA bill coming due uh, is because of that decision uh, to uh, put it all on the table and to not wait and to say we're not going to wait. Uh, we're not going to make certain veterans wait. That has had consequences uh, for uh, uh, meeting the challenges in the VHA. Uh, and uh, making sure there's adequate health care for everybody. Uh, so uh, so I want to th thank you all for the problem we have now, uh, which is that uh, the PACT Act uh, has been far more successful and has made uh, a difference in so many veterans' lives, uh, and it was because the VSO community all came together and said, this is what our veterans need, and it's a demonstration of DV, uh, DAV's uh, stature and its moral force as a voice for veterans in this country. So I want to thank you and all of you thank for you. that. Um, and, uh, but, here's the big but. Uh, we've increased eligibility, we've increased access, uh, but we now need to get down to the staffing. We need to get down to the right balance between uh, community care and direct care. And we need to get these buildings fixed. Uh, we are yes. I, we're like 40, 50-year-old buildings 
We have got to get that done. Yeah. That is, that is, these are the three big things on my agenda uh, come right. to Congress. Well, infrastructure is a huge uh, issue we've been pushing for. We want to make sure, and again, that has a lot to do with funding, and um, we could spend an hour on infrastructure <laughs> issues. But I hope, um, I'll just close out by saying, again, thank you. We appreciate both of what you do. Um, I think, though, there is this expectation. Um, the American people want to make sure that our veterans are cared for. Um, we hear, you know, we bandy about 12 million, 12 billion, um, it, regardless of the cost. And I know there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, competing uh, priorities for the government, but we feel there should never be one more important than our nation's veterans. And I know you both feel strongly about that, and uh, we hope that Congress can work together and do right, do the right thing. Um, we can't let our veterans go without the care and benefits that they need, not for one day, not for one minute. So again, um, appreciate that you're here and how candid you've been and open. It's been a pleasure this afternoon, and thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you, thank you.